Hi guys, welcome to Preplader Neat SS. This is Dr. Patil, your medicine mentor. And today we are going to learn about pulmonary embolism. According to me, this is a very, very important topic for two reasons. Reason number one, lot of MCQs, starting from basics, etiology, risk factors, moving on to the pathophysiology, clinical findings, imaging, radiology, CT pulmonary angio images, and the management decisions, the diagnostic algorithm, everything has been tested as MCQ. Even neat PG is filled with MCQs from pulmonary embolism. But the second important reason is that most of the pulmonary embolism cases remain undiagnosed and they are diagnosed post-mortem. Sometimes they don't even get diagnosed. So it is of paramount importance for a medicine person to recognize pulmonary embolism early in the course of the illness so that we can manage them effectively, right? Because it is after your coronary vascular events and the CVAs or strokes, third most important vascular cause for mortality is pulmonary embolism right okay now do i need to define pulmonary embolism for you no you know what is pulmonary embolism basically a venous clot most likely developing in the lower limb escapes the initial site and lands up into the pulmonary artery that's what we call as pulmonary embolism and hospitalization and various other parameters are important risk factors for pulmonary embolism so let me start with the etiology for pulmonary embolism now, from the pathology days, we are familiar with what is called as virtuous triad, right? Virtuous triad is a risk factor for venous thrombosis. Virtuous triad brings our attention to the risk factors for venous thrombosis. So, what are the components of the triad? Number one is stasis. The stasis of blood, if it is not flowing, it is vulnerable for formation of clot. Number two is hypercoagulability. Hypercoagulability. Okay. Then what is the third component? Obviously, endothelial injury. So whenever there is endothelial injury, there is formation of platelet aggregation and that can lead to development of a clot. Now, do we need all these three risk factors to be present for a venous clot to form? The answer is no. Even one of this risk factor can be sufficient to form a venous clot. But when all these three are there, definitely it's a high risk condition. Okay, now we know that these three things coming together or in any permutational combination or sometimes just the one is responsible for development of clot. Let us look at these individual contributions. Okay, now talking about stasis. Two important points you need to remember is prolonged immobilization is an important reason for stasis. Okay, so what do you mean by prolonged immobilization? Generally, immobilization for more than 72 hours. Prolonged immobilization prolonged here means generally more than 72 hours okay that's an important reason now under what circumstances patients might get immobilized for more than 72 hours number one post-operative period right surgery and post-operative phase is an important risk factor so this can happen after surgery right post-op period and second this can happen when there are prolonged flight right long distance journey or long distance flight now you might ask me, sir, why are you not talking about long distance bus travel, train travel? Mostly we mobilize ourselves like bus travel every four or five hours or maybe like seven, eight hours. There may be a break. Uh, if it is train travel, mostly when we feel bored, we start uh, pacing around in the train. But it is the flight, especially the economy class, which is where mobility is seriously affected, right? Long distance flights. These two are important contributors for prolonged immobilization. MCQ wise, they might ask you among the surgeries, which surgeries carry the highest risk, right? So I want you to remember this point particularly among the surgeries, which surgeries carry highest risk and anybody is giving me the answer. Okay. So please remember it is generally the orthopedic surgeries than the non-orthopedic surgeries. So ortho surgeries have higher risk than non-orthopedic surgeries. Okay, and when we talk about orthopedic surgeries, right, remember pelvic, hip joint or lower limb surgeries carry higher risk than the upper limb surgeries. Simple reason is the lower limb veins are more prone for uh, development of thrombus and lower limb immobilization definitely increases the risk of development of thrombus. Okay, now coming to the hypercoagulability, right, so hypercoagulability that state can be acquired or inherited, right? So there are genetic causes and they might ask you what are the important inherited causes for hypercoagulability. So I want you to remember the most common inherited hypercoagulability causes. 
most common inherited hypercoagulopathy cause number one is like first or the overall most common is factor 5 Leiden mutation factor 5 Leiden mutation okay and number two second most common inherited cause for hypercoagulability or thrombophilic state that is your prothrombin gene mutation prothrombin gene mutation prothrombin gene mutation is the second most common okay then what are the important acquired causes for hypercoagulability that we need to remember mostly if they're asking an mcq it will be in the form of what is the most common acquired thrombophilic state so most common acquired thrombophilic state is very important mcq point that is your antiphospholipid antibody syndrome or apla apla is the most common okay so i hope you are getting the gist of what we are discussing the prolonged immobilization in terms of surgery orthopedic surgeries have much higher risk than non orthopedic surgeries and especially the orthopedic surgeries involving the pelvis hip joint or the lower limb so typically speaking it is the the total hip replacement and the total knee replacement surgeries carry the very high risk of development of thrombosis okay then in terms of hypercoagulable states most common inherited hypercoagulable state is factor 5 Leiden mutation and the most common acquired hypercoagulable state is antiphospholipid antibody syndrome which are responsible for the development of dvt and thus pulmonary embolism now coming to the third component that is endothelial injury right what are the factors that contributes to endo endothelial injury uh, important things i want you to remember is sepsis sepsis and infections they're important right because sepsis very often has disseminated intravascular coagulation some of the patients of sepsis die because of the development of pulmonary embolism then during this covid we saw a lot of patients presenting with pulmonary embolism extensive by disseminated intravascular coagulation all of that is related to endothelial injury right okay now one important extra point i wanted to remember is malignancy is a very important risk factor malignancy is a very important risk factor and they might ask you among the malignancies which malignancies carry the very high risk of development of uh, dvt and the spe right so for that you need to remember adenocarcinomas of whatever site adenocarcinomas adenocarcinomas carry very high risk compared to the other malignancies adenocarcinomas carry very high risk okay so this is in brief about the etiology for pulmonary embolism more of that will be discussed under the dvt section now having understood etiology and the important mcq points let us look at the pathophysiology now what is happening in the pulmonary embolism a clot is occluding the pulmonary artery or its branches as simple as that right so mostly clot is getting formed most common site for the clot to form and embolize is your soleal veins or calf veins in terms of the risk of embolism it is more proximal the clot higher the risk of embolism but most common site for the dvt to occur is in the soleal veins or your calf veins but your femoral veins the iliac veins inferior vena cava they carry very high risk of embolism calf veins carry lower risk of embolism but that is where most likely the thrombus is going to happen okay the clot formed in proximal veins will ascend through the inferior vena cava and reach the right atrium from the right atrium it is reaching your right ventricle and then eventually getting lodged in pulmonary artery either the main pulmonary artery or its branches right or left pulmonary arteries or the segmental or subsegmental branches okay so for the purpose of understanding the pathophysiology let us believe that there is a clot which is now occluding the pulmonary artery now if there is a clot now i am drawing a saddle shaped clot which is occluding both right may right and left pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary main trunk now once this clot is now occluding the pulmonary trunk and its branches what are the hemodynamic consequences we can expect okay number one because of the clot being present in the pulmonary artery the amount of blood ejected out from the right ventricle is not reaching to the lungs right it is unable to reach to the lungs so it is reduced the amount of blood reaching the lungs the capillary vascular bed in the lungs is reduced so that's the first consequence and whenever that happens right there is hypoperfusion of the lung vasculature and that leads to vasoconstriction so the net result is because of this first thing you will start seeing is there is development of increased pulmonary vascular resistance 
right and there is pulmonary vasoconstriction pulmonary vasoconstriction vasoconstriction and once the pulmonary vasoconstriction happens what is the outcome of that once the pulmonary vasoconstriction happens and increased pulmonary vascular resistance there is decreased perfusion of the lungs lung perfusion is reduced okay i'll come back to this later whatever have consequences of this decreased perfusion what is going to happen at the level of right ventricle there is reduced a perfusion of the lungs yeah i agreed now the presence of this clot makes it very difficult for to right for the right ventricle to eject the blood into the pulmonary circulation so the result is there is increased right ventricular workload right there is increased rv workload once the rv workload increases obviously its oxygen demand increases right so this leads to increased o2 demand its oxygen demand is increasing will it get the adequate oxygen supply or will it struggle it will struggle why will it struggle the reason it will struggle is because the right ventricular output is reduced because of the presence of clot and the obstruction the right ventricular output is reduced it is not able to push out all the blood because at this level there is difficulty and it has to do a lot of work to overcome it so because the right ventricular output is reduced the amount of blood that is coming to the lungs is reduced that we have already discussed now left atrium is receiving the blood that is coming from the lungs if the lungs are receiving less quantity of blood then your left atrium is also going to get less quantity of blood so if left atrium is getting less quantity of blood that means lv is also getting less quantity of blood lv input is reduced right so if the lv input is reduced then the left ventricular output is also going to be reduced left ventricular output is also going to be reduced now this reduced lv output will have many consequences right so one of the outcome of this is also reduced right ventricular output reduced right ventricular output will lead to reduced left ventricular output this reduced left ventricular output the consequences is there is decreased cardiac output decreased coronary perfusion decreased coronary perfusion now this decreased coronary perfusion will also affect the rv which is now requiring more oxygen demand right so this decreased coronary perfusion will hinder further and the net result is your right ventricle start developing micro infarctions rv micro infarctions now these micro infarcts eventually will lead to rv dilation this rv dilation will further complicate the things because now the right ventricle is dilated it has systolic dysfunction its rv output it is contributing to reduced rv output further it is contributing to the reduced rv output further okay again the story doesn't stop here as the right ventricle start dilating the right ventricle and left ventricle that in between that interventricular septum now because the rv is dilating the interventricular septum get shifted into left ventricle it is getting pushed into because rv pressure is more it is exceeding the pressure that is building up on the right ventricle and left ventricle so the interventricular septum is now getting pushed into the lv so the lv cavity size is further decreasing so what will it lead to already we had decreased lv output because of the decreased lv filling now this interventricular septum making the lv cavity smaller will further complicate it right so lv output will further go down because of the interventricular shift right so remember this rv dilation will lead to interventricular septum shifting into lv shifting into lv now this will again contribute to reduced cardiac output so reduced cardiac output now becomes a major problem whenever there is massive pulmonary embolism you will see reduced cardiac output so now tell me what is the consequence of this reduced cardiac output one is yes decreased coronary perfusion further complicating the rv dynamics but this will also lead to hypotension that is why we use hypotension as a marker of massive embolism and patients can develop syncope because once the cardiac output is so low the cerebral perfusion is also affected they can start presenting with syncope right now at the level of lungs let's see what happens there is decreased perfusion but alveolar ventilation is unaffected 
right so there is decreased perfusion but normal alveolar ventilation to start with as long as the patient doesn't have a respiratory disorder there is normal alveolar ventilation so alveoli have got sufficient gas but it is not leading to the oxygenation of the blood because the blood flow to significant areas of the lung is reduced so what does it lead to this this both put together leads to what we call as increased dead space ventilation increased dead space ventilation and this can manifest as increased alveolar and arterial oxygen gradient increased aa gradient okay now we have to also remember that sometimes if there is a small blood vessel which is very towards the periphery of the lung if that gets occluded not the the main pulmonary arteries or the main trunk or the segmental branches like sub segmental branches or small tributaries get occluded it can lead to infarct right pulmonary infarct or lung infarct that typically manifests on the x-ray or the ct as a pleura based wedge shaped opacity because you know when lungs are being perfused because the blood vessels are branching out like this if you occlude one of the particular blood vessel let me say that we are occluding this particular blood vessel then the area supplied by this blood vessel will be something like that and that area will develop a infarct right so it has this wedge shaped or triangle shaped opacity has base towards the pleura and apex towards the hilum right that's how it looks like and on the x-ray we call it as hampton's hump we will be seeing an image later but now understand whenever you see a pulmonary infarct it means that most likely it's a mild or a small embolism most likely it's a mild or small embolism so it is typically seen with small embolism if a main pulmonary artery or the main pulmonary trunk is affected you will rather see these patients presenting with uh, hypotension and syncope and significant respiratory distress rather than presenting with a peripheral infarct okay now apart from this pulmonary infarct can also lead to hemoptysis that can also be one of the presenting complaint okay apart from this at the level of lungs lung also reacts to all these changes that are happening so at the level of lung what is happening is there is activation of irritant receptors irritant receptors and because there is activation of irritant receptors this can lead to two things one is cough patients start can have vigorous cough second thing is it can also trigger bronchoconstriction bronchoconstriction okay now this is very important as a postgraduate student i want you to understand this okay for an undergraduate student i won't teach this okay i'll make a statement the statement is in case of pulmonary embolism a normal alveolar arterial oxygen gradient does not rule out pulmonary embolism it is like traditionally taught that yeah you have a grossly increased alveolar and arterial oxygen gradient because that's what the pathophysiology talks about reduced perfusion maintained ventilation but the truth is some of these patients once they develop severe bronchoconstriction even the alveolar ventilation can be reduced there is increased airway hyper airway resistance and the alveolar ventilation is reduced so in such cases they may have a normal alveolar and arterial oxygen gradient so it does not rule out pulmonary embolism i hope the point is clear okay now this dead space ventilation and uh, the increased gradient the consequence of this is that you start developing hypoxia and in response to hypoxia this hypoxia will trigger many consequences right in response to hypoxia patient will start developing tachypnea symptom wise he will develop dyspnea to compensate for hypoxia respiratory system is now into tachypnea as a response again there is tachycardia but sometimes there is activation of vagal receptors inside the lungs and that can lead to bradycardia so again remember tachycardia is the most common finding but bradycardia does not rule out pulmonary embolism so this is the pathophysiology of pulmonary embolism okay so in this flow chart i have just quickly summarized the same points that we have discussed so we have developed a clot in the pulmonary artery that has led to increased pulmonary vascular resistance and pulmonary vasoconstriction that leads to decreased perfusion of the lungs increased dead space ventilation thus increased alveolar arterial gra gradient that leads to hypoxemia 
Hypoxemia will result into reflex stimulation of irritant receptors that leads to cough and bronchoconstriction. Right? The importance of bronchoconstriction I have already described. Patient starts hyperventilating. So we will see that hyperventilation is just a compensatory mechanism for hypoxia. Okay. Now, the other consequence is that patients start developing right ventricular strain. Yeah, the right ventricular strain eventually will lead to right ventricular dilation because of microinfarcts. Microinfarcts are because of reduced left ventricular output, reduced coronary perfusion, microinfarction, dilation. Right. So once there is dilation, interventricular septum shifts into LV, which will further contribute to reduce in reduction in the cardiac output. So patient develops hypotension. Right. Okay. Now RV output we have discussed that reduced RV output also contributes to reduced LV output, contributes to hypotension and thus contributes to development of syncope. Then reduced perfusion of the lung can lead to pulmonary infarcts. Yeah, that typically leads to presentation in the form of pleuritic chest pain because this infarct is pleura based. There is irritation and inflammation of the pleura and they can present with pleuritic chest pain. Yeah, I also forgot to tell you that right ventricular strain, once the right ventricle is burdened, right, that will lead to increased production of BNP. Whenever it is getting stretched, it will lead to increased production of BNP. So we can use it as a marker of RV strain. And once there are micro infarcts being developed, so troponin I levels will go up so we can also use it as a marker of myocardial injury right okay so that's about the pathophysiology now coming to clinical features most common symptom it's a repeatedly asked mcq point most common symptom is obviously dyspnea dyspnea is the most common symptom most common sign is tachypnea tachypnea most common sign is tachypnea what are the symptoms patients might present with The other symptoms patient might present with include number one syncope especially when there is massive embolism second thing they can present is with cough especially when it is a small embolism presenting with pulmonary infarct they can have pleuritic chest pain and they can also have hemoptysis they can also have hemoptysis these are the symptoms we can expect okay in terms of other signs that i want you to remember most common sign is tachypnea followed by they can also have tachycardia. The other signs that we need to remember, okay, they might have evidence of DVT. They might have symptoms also suggestive of DVT. Symptoms suggestive of DVT. They can have clinical evidence of DVT. Then they can have accentuated second heart sound, particularly the P2 right because of the right ventricular uh, morphological changes that they're going to they going through they can have accentuated p2 these are the other signs that we need to be aware about yeah in terms of jvp if the right ventricle is failing you can have a prominent a wave on the jvp right those are the changes we will be seeing in terms of clinical features most important thing is high index of suspicion being aware of the risk factors for dvt and p and high index of suspicion is the most important thing that will clinch the diagnosis so the main clincher is no clue it is the high index of suspicion so if you're not suspecting you will miss plenty of these cases so please remember this clincher is high index of suspicion no physical finding is a main clincher it is the suspicion patient prolonged immobilized patient having sepsis patient in icu patient in hospital for long duration of time patient coming returning from international travel Patient having previous history of DVT or pulmonary embolism, patient having the diagnosis of malignancies, all of them you should suspect pulmonary embolism at the slightest hint of tachypnea or cough. Right? Remember that point. Okay. Now coming to the classification of pulmonary embolism. So far we have discussed the etiology, the pathophysiology, which was very, very important for us to understand, and we have discussed about the basic clinical features. Now, once you have considered that this patient could be a case of pulmonary embolism, it is very important for us to classify it into whether it belongs to massive, submassive or mild moderate. So how do we classify? First thing we look at is whether the patient's blood pressure is normal or abnormal. Hemodynamic stability is very, very important. We have learned that from the pathophysiology section that if patient is hemodynamically unstable, it means there is significant clot burden that has led to the right ventricular output being reduced and uh, the left ventricular output being reduced so it, it basically means that the clot burden is really high okay so classification we classify into three things first one is massive now how do we define 
massive pulmonary embolism so we define massive pulmonary embolism by looking at one blood pressure that's the most important thing all your mcqs are mostly going to talk about blood pressure bp less than 90 by 60 millimeters of mercury at any point of time during the course of the illness that will be classified as massive pulmonary embolism okay or sometimes like patient before coming to you some doctor might have given a little bit of fluids and that would have pushed the bp back to normalcy but still patient might have evidence of hypoperfusion so if there is evidence of hypoperfusion evidence of reduced perfusion that can also be like increased capillary filling time or cold and clammy extremities or any other parameters which says that there is reduced perfusion that will also be considered as massive pulmonary embolism okay and third is multi organ failure with evidence of extensive clot extensive clot so if there is an extensive clot very large thrombus maybe main pulmonary trunk or saddle pulmonary embolism and then the patient also has multi organ failure which can be linked to this clot that can also be considered as massive so for mcq exams mostly it is about 90 60 but still remember that these two parameters are important evidence of decreased perfusion or an extensive clot with multi organ failure will also be classified as massive okay now coming to submassive in submassive patient is hemodynamically stable so his bp is normal there is no evidence of hypoperfusion right so this is a patient with normal hemodynamic parameters bp is more than 90 by 60 millimeters of mercury but here he has a evidence of right ventricular dysfunction rv dysfunction is evidenced from the echocardiogram or the ct there is evidence of right ventricular dysfunction okay or he has increased biomarkers again those are independent evidence of uh, rv dysfunction itself like either bnp or troponins either bnp or troponins are elevated then you can say that you are dealing with a case of submassive okay now what is the mild pulmonary embolism obviously one that has no evidence of hypotension or hemodynamic compromise so this patient is number one hemodynamically stable hemodynamically stable second no evidence of rv dysfunction on echo or ct and third biomarkers are negative biomarkers are normal or negative that's what we call as mild pulmonary embolism okay so this classification is important because it influences the management whether you will directly take the patient with thrombolysis or just do anticoagulation or you will do anticoagulation but very closely monitor and if patient's parameters are not improving then take for the rescue thrombolysis what method you follow depends on whether it is submassive mild or massive pulmonary embolism and lot of questions have been asked on this either you make a decision for the patient in the question or they directly ask you to classify whether this particular patient that is being described belongs to massive submassive or mild right very very important mcq segment okay now after the classification of pulmonary embolism let us look at the laboratory tests that we use for diagnosis i'll come to the diagnostic algorithm later first let us understand these individual tests first test we are talking about is there is a clot so obviously we are going to talk about d dimer i want you to remember important point point number one is that d dimer is highly sensitive its sensitivity is very high highly sensitive but poor specificity poor specificity now what do i mean by this it is highly sensitive so it can be used as a good screening tool okay but because of its poor specificity the reliability on the positive result is affected so it has better negative predictive value right so it has good negative predictive value so it is morely uh, more useful for ruling out it has better negative predictive value so it is more useful for ruling out the dvt and pulmonary embolism rather than for ruling in okay so that is the one thing and when i say it has poor specificity it means that it can be falsely positive so in what circumstances it can be falsely positive look at the list that i have made here pregnancy 
one of the important risk factor for development of DVT, oral contraceptives and pregnancy. These are risk factors for development of DVT. And unfortunately, in those patients, it is not reliable. Old age. Yeah, old age is also a risk factor for DVT and PE. And in those age group, it is not reliable. Malignancy, a very important risk factor, not reliable. Recent surgery, a very important risk factor, not reliable. So that is why a D-dimer result should be taken with a pinch of salt, especially for a positive confirmation of the diagnosis. For ruling out, it is really useful because it's highly sensitive. So for ruling out, it is highly useful. Now, I want you to remember one statement from 2019 European Society of Cardiology guidelines for pulmonary embolism. Right? They have recommended that in elderly individuals, in elderly individuals, right, age defined cutoff should be used. You cannot just have a random one cutoff for all age group. At least in the geriatric population, you have to follow an age defined cutoff. That is what 2019 European Society of Cardiology guidelines on pulmonary embolism recommend. Okay. Now, after the D dimer, let us look at the next important investigation that is CT pulmonary angiogram. Right? It is the gold standard. It is the gold standard, and right now it is the investigation of choice. Investigation of choice for the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. Okay. Now on the CT pulmonary angio, we are mostly looking for a filling defect in the pulmonary vasculature. In pulmonary vasculature, pulmonary vasculature. It may be in the pul main pulmonary trunk or right or left pulmonary artery or its segmental or subsegmental branches or any peripheral part of it. Right. So let us see how it looks on a CT image. Now this is a CT image where you can see the main pulmonary trunk dividing into right and left pulmonary arteries. This is the main pulmonary trunk, right pulmonary artery, left pulmonary artery. All white you are seeing is filled with contrast. But can we make a note of this filling defect here? Right. So this defect is exactly at the bifurcation of the main pulmonary trunk into right and left. This is what we call as saddle thrombus. This is a saddle thrombus. Hemodynamically, this will have catastrophic consequences and this clinically is most likely to present as a massive pulmonary embolism. Right. So this is one uh, image based question you can anticipate. And the second thing is there is something called as polo mint sign. Polo mint sign. Again, we're looking at a contrast filling defect and you remember polo mint, which we used to eat these white colored polo mint tablets, right? Like mouth freshness we used to use. Something similar to that can be visible on the CT pulmonary angio. Okay. Now, this is your pulmonary artery. This is the pulmonary artery. You can see that it is peripherally filled with contrast, right? Uh, almost peripherally filled with contrast with a central filling defect, right? With a central filling defect. So this is what we call as polo mint sign. So pulmonary artery with peripherally filled with contrast, but centrally there is a filling defect. This is what we call as polo mint sign. This also may be visible and this is also an important image based question I want you to be aware about. These are the two important radiological findings. Yeah, apart from that, you can see if there is a pulmonary infarct that may be visible very much on the CT thorax. Okay. Now coming to ABG. If we do ABG, what are the findings we are expecting? First thing we are expecting is there will be significant hypoxemia. So the patient's PAO2 would be significantly reduced. And second thing is there is increased alveolar and arterial O2 gradient. But please remember that normal gradient does not rule out PE. Gradient does not rule out pulmonary embolism. I have explained the pathophysiological basis behind that. And because of the reduced cardiac output, because of the reduced cardiac output, these patients might have peripheral hypoperfusion and thus peripheral tissues, muscles and all may be pushed to anaerobic metabolism. So they can develop lactic acidosis. So they may develop metabolic acidosis on the ABG. Okay. And because often they are hyperventilating, 
they can have respiratory alkalosis. They are hyperventilating, they can have respiratory alkalosis. So these are all possible outcomes on the ABG. Okay, what is the role of ABG in diagnosis of pulmonary embolism? Close to nil, right? It is mostly for managing hypoxemia. We are taking guide, ABG as a guide, but not for the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. Okay, now coming to the cardiac markers. We have discussed two cardiac markers. First one is BNP, right? It indicates that there is RV strain and you can have raised troponins. Both of them are markers of prognosis. So we can use it for also understanding the prognosis. So troponins indicate that there is RV microinfarcts or in other words myocardial injury right and they correlate with the prognosis that is why we use them in classification of pulmonary embolism correlate with prognosis okay now coming to ECG first important MCQ point is they might ask you what is the most common ECG finding and the most common ECG finding is not S1Q3 T3 it is sinus tachycardia sinus tachycardia apart from this you might have right axis deviation and right bundle branch block you can have right axis deviation you can have right bundle branch block and the s1 q3 t3 is rare right we are all aware that it is rare i have not seen any patient directly presenting with pulmonary embolism and ecg showing s1 q3 t3 whatever ecgs i have seen is from the internet or textbooks but still because it is of historical interest we should know and we should be able to identify that on the ECG. So let me project an ECG. So this is an ECG which a patient presented with uh, shortness of breath and in lead one we can see that there is predominant S wave, right? Predominant S wave in lead one and when you shift to lead three you will start seeing that dominant Q waves. So that's why we call it as Q3 and there is inverted T waves, T inversion in lead three. So that's why we call it as T3. So this is our S1, Q3, T3 pattern. Okay, so this is about ECG. Now coming to echo. We are doing echo mainly to understand RV dynamics. RV dynamics. And we are mostly looking for RV dysfunction. But sometimes when we are doing echo, the main pulmonary trunk, the pulmonary artery trunk, if there is a clot, it may be visible. Right, a good a good cardiologist may be able to pick up a pulmonary artery or a, a saddle thrombus from the echocardiography itself. Right? Okay. But apart from that, our real interest is in understanding the RV dynamics or RV dysfunction. So how do we identify RV dysfunction? RV dysfunction is identified on the echocardiogram by looking at RV by LV end diastolic diameter ratio. So you take the diameter of LV and RV at the end of diastole and if it is more than one that means your LV diameter is less than RV diameter that's why it's more than one that indicates that there is RV dysfunction and the second parameter that can be used for RV dysfunction on the echo is your right ventricular end diastolic diameter alone end diastolic diameter alone more than 30 millimeters or 3 centimeters indicates that there is RV dysfunction okay apart from these two parameters I also want you to remember that there is an important sign called as McConnell sign McConnell sign which can be asked as an image based question or they might directly ask you where is it seen or nowadays that there is a trend of giving these GIF images in the exams you might get a GIF image of McConnell sign with a little bit of build up like patient with shortness of breath and uh, prolonged immobilization or other risk factors known APLA presenting with these symptoms and echo shows this what is the sign being demonstrated right so what is McConnell sign McConnell sign is basically there is hypokinesia or akinesia of right ventricular free wall hypokinesia or akinesia of rv free wall with sparing of rv apex so somehow the rv apex is showing a little bit of contraction but the free wall is hypokinetic or akinetic okay yeah i also forgot to tell you that apart from this you will also see that the interventricular septum is 
shifted towards LV or shifted into LV cavity. That is also evident on the echocardiogram, right? So now let us see a McConnell sign. Okay, so this is your left ventricle, this is your right ventricle, this is your LA, this is your RA. Okay, when you look at the contraction of the left ventricle, this is interventricular septum, look at the contraction of the left ventricle. Don't you think it is contracting well? Isn't it contracting well? But look at the contraction of the right ventricular. Just let me draw your attention to the right ventricular free wall. See, look at that portion. Is it contracting well? Minimally contracting, right? But look at the apex. This is where the apex is there. Is it contracting well? To some extent, it is contracting well, right? So there is in this, so there is hypokinesia of RV free wall with sparing of apex. And what do we call this as? We call this as McConnell sign. McConnell sign, right? So please be aware about this McConnell sign. Now after the echo, let us look at the X-ray. Okay, is X-ray diagnostic of pulmonary embolism? It can raise high index of suspicion, but we never base our diagnosis on X-ray. And is it going to be abnormal in all patients? The obvious answer is no, right? Most patients have normal chest X-ray. Most patients have normal chest X-ray. In fact, when you have patients with normal chest X-ray and present with dyspnea, Right. That is where we start suspecting the pulmonary embolism more. Okay, but some findings which are like which are named, which can be very important for exam, right? Not for your real practice. We'll go through them. So the first thing that we'll learn, we'll be learning is what we're seeing here in this X-ray. If you pay attention to the right side, okay. See on the left, you can see that the vascular markings are seen throughout the lung, but on the right side, there is a segment where the vascular markings are not well seen. So basically, there is reduced perfusion in this area, right? So in other words, I can call this as focal oligamia. Oligamia. And this has a named sign. What do we call that as? We call it as Westermark sign. Who first described it? It is Westermark sign. Focal oligamia. The same x-ray, there is also another important finding. Okay, look at this. There is prominent right descending pulmonary artery right now what do we call this finding as this is known as palace sign sometimes you can have a prominent right main pulmonary artery then we will call it as fleshner sign fleshner's sign when it is the prominent right descending art pulmonary artery we will call it as palace sign sometimes this prominent right descending artery can have an abrupt cutoff in that case we call it as chang sign okay and the other radiological finding that we need to remember is they can have a pleura based wedge shaped opacity which is nothing but an infarct and this is what we call as hampton's hump hampton's Hum. Okay, all of these are of particular interest for the exam rather than for real practice. Okay, now after the x-ray, let us talk about the diagnostic approach. So we know now that we have D-dimer at our disposal. We have CT pulmonary angio, then we have x-ray, ECG, ABG, and we know the relative utility of this, right? Now let us put all that into perspective and see how we approach a case where we have a suspicion of pulmonary embolism. Okay, so point number one suspicion of pulmonary embolism clinical suspicion of pulmonary embolism the next question is hemodynamic stability hemodynamic stable if you say no patient is hemodynamically unstable such patients directly without wasting any time go ahead with the gold standard investigation which is CT pulmonary angiogram directly go ahead with CTPA a patient with some risk factors for uh, uh, DVT or pulmonary embolism now presented with dyspnea you're suspecting pulmonary embolism okay his BP is less than 90 60 or there is evidence of peripheral hypoperfusion 
straight away go ahead with CT pulmonary angio. Do not waste time on D-dimer or anything else. And D-dimer in this case is not going to be a clincher for diagnosis. As I have told you, it is more for ruling out rather than for ruling in. But if the patient is hemodynamically stable, right, then we have to assess the risk and then decide what next we do. So if the patient is stable, we have to assess the clinical probability for hemodynamic without hemodynamic instability or hemodynamically stable patients, we have to assess the clinical probability. How can we assess the clinical probability? Either we can use Wells score. Mostly currently we use modified Wells score. right? But more than Wells score, nowadays we are following revised Geneva score. Revised Geneva score. So based on these scores, if the patient is said to have high clinical probability or the pulmonary embolism is very likely, in that case, again, without wasting your time and energy on the D-dimer, go ahead with the CT pulmonary angiogram. Okay. If the CT pulmonary angiogram shows that there is a pulmonary embolism, you will treat accordingly. And because CT pulmonary angiogram is also highly sensitive, if you don't find a embolism on CT, maybe you can think of investigating for other causes. Okay. On the other hand, patient has low or intermediate probability of having a pulmonary embolism on re revised Geneva score or PE seems unlikely on the Wells score. Like nowadays, Wells score we just divide into PE likely or PE unlikely, 4 or less than 4, right? In the revised Geneva, we can classify it into low, intermediate or high probability. So if it is a low or intermediate probability on revised Geneva or based on Wells score, the pulmonary embolism is unlikely. Now, this is the circumstance where we will do a D-dimer. Okay. Now, if D-dimer is negative, it rules out pulmonary embolism. That's what I had been repeatedly telling you. It has high negative predictive value. So, on well score or revised Geneva also, we had low possibility of having a PE. We did a D-dimer. It is negative. Both put together, we ruled out. Right? On the other hand, if D-dimer comes positive, still because we are starting with low clinical probability, the positive D-dimer alone is not sufficient for the diagnosis. It doesn't have a high positive predictive value. So, we still need to confirm. Right. So for confirmation, we are again going to CT pulmonary angio. If pulmonary embolism present, good, we treat. CT pulmonary angio not showing the pulmonary embolism, then we will think of looking for other diagnostic uh, investigations for other possible causes. Okay. So that is the approach to pulmonary embolism. This is going to be very, very important for your MCQ exams because they generally build up scenarios like this is a patient who presented with these symptoms. They will either tell you the revised Geneva score or they will tell you the Wells score and then they will ask you to decide the next step or they will give you information required for coming out with well score or revised Geneva score and you have to make a next decision whether you will do D-dimer, whether you will do CTPA and if the D-dimer is done, uh, how do you interpret further, right? Because we need to know Wells and revised Geneva score, let us pay also attention to Wells and Geneva score. So in Wells score, what I am projecting is modified Wells score. So these are the parameters. Presence of clinical signs and symptoms of DVT, we will give three points. Because if DVT is there and patient is breathless or patient is having other signs and symptoms suggestive of pulmonary embolism, high probability, right? So good points are given to that. If there is no alternative diagnosis possible, like the patient's symptom cluster cannot be explained by any other diagnosis. So sometimes the dyspnea in a patient elderly with already known cardiac dysfunction can be explained from cardiac dysfunction. But if there is no other alternate diagnosis uh, can explain the cluster of symptoms, then you will give three points. Okay. Patient's heart rate more than 100. We know why tachycardia occurs. 1.5 points. If there is history of immobilization for more than 3 days, that's what we were discussing, 72 hours. Or if there is surgery in the previous 4 weeks, MCQs generally mention this point. So please keep in mind, 1.5 points. If there is evidence of previous DVT or pulmonary embolism, 1.5 points. We have learned that hemoptysis can be a symptom, 1 point. Malignancy with active treatment in the last 6 months. Malignancy that was diagnosed and treated before 6 months and then in last 6 months there is no active malignancy and no treatment happening. That is not a risk factor, right? But if there is an active malignancy or malignancy which has been treated within last 6 months, 1 point. Or if the patient is uh, malignant and is under palliative care, obviously 1 point. Now, all this cumulative score, if it is less than or equal to 4, P is unlikely. P is unlikely and if it is more than 4 that means 4.5 or 5 or anything more that is P likely okay so this algorithm whenever it, it talks about P likely or P unlikely it is deriving from the well score okay and whenever it talks about high clinical probability or lower intermediate probability it is deriving from the revised Geneva score
Okay. So revised Geneva score looks at risk factors, symptoms, clinical signs and clinical probability is arrived upon. If age is more than 65 years, I told you age is a risk factor, one point. If previous DVT or pulmonary embolism, three points. Surgery under general anesthesia or fracture of the lower limbs within last one month, two points. Remember, right? I have told you the pelvic and lower limb surgeries are high risk. So that's why the specific points are given to it. Okay. Active malignant condition, solid or hematological malignant, currently active or considered cured within one year, two points. In terms of symptoms, unilateral lower limb pain points towards the diagnosis of DVT, three points. Hemoptysis, two points. Clinical science wise, heart rate, here it is graded. In well score, 100 plus, yeah, we had score. Here it is graded. If it is between 75 to 94, three points. 95 plus, five points. And pain on lower limb, deep venous palpation and unilateral edema, four points. So if there is tenderness of the calf or if there is unilateral edema, you are giving four points. Now based on that, 0 to 3 score low probability, then 4 to 10 it is intermediate probability and more than or equal to 11 it is high probability. Right? So all these terminologies that we learnt in the algorithm, high probability means revised Geneva more than or equal to 11. Right? PE likely means your modified wells more than 4 that is 4.5 or 5 okay so here low means 0 to 3 revised Geneva and intermediate means 4 to 10 revised Geneva and P unlikely means a score of less than or equal to 4 on wells right I hope you got the gist of it okay now that's about the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism so guys, now it's time for us to talk about the management of pulmonary embolism. The first question that we should address whenever you have a diagnosed case of pulmonary embolism is to know whether your patient is hemodynamically stable or not stable because that's going to make a difference to the management. We all by now clearly understand that any patient who is hemodynamically unstable, hemodynamically unstable, our mainstay of management for such patients is going to be fibrinolysis or thrombolysis. Hemodynamically unstable patient means basically I'm talking about massive PE. So for all cases of massive pulmonary embolism, we are going ahead with fibrinolysis. That's our mainstay of management. Okay. Now there may be contraindications for fibrinolysis. In such circumstances, what are the alternative options we have? Okay. So we have to remember that if contraindications present, then alternatively we can either offer surgical embolectomy you cannot do systemic fibrinolysis like for example there's a case with head injury and then he has developed a dvt and pulmonary embolism systemic thrombolysis is highly contraindicated in such cases to save the life of the patient you can go ahead with surgical embolectomy or alternatively in some cases it will happen that you have minor contraindications in terms of bleeding risk so this full-fledged systemic thrombolysis might put the patient at significant risk of bleeding but at the same time a reduced dose of fibrinolytic agent may not be considered as an overt risk in such cases we can do what is called as catheter guided thrombolysis so the patient needs to be wheeled into a cath lab catheterize reach the site where the clot is there and directly deliver the fibrinolytic agent there instead of giving it into the artery or a vein so that way you will be minimizing the dose required, right? So conventionally when you do fibrinolysis, we have to remember that the preferred agent for fibrinolysis is fibrin specific agents. Now what do I mean by fibrin specific agents? We have fibrin non-specific agents like streptokinase and urokinase which are not routinely considered nowadays and we have fibrin specific agents like the RTPA, tenecteplase, retiplase, one of these can be used. Okay. Now, among the agents, again, the preferred fibrin specific agent is tenecteplase. The reason for that is tenecteplase is given as a bolus instead of giving it as an infusion. Right? If you are giving the RTPA, we need to give it as an infusion over two hours. So, if you are using RTPA, it will be in the form of infusion. 100 milligrams infusion over two hours. But tenecteplase, 30 to 50 milligrams, depending on the patient's weight, it is weight dependent, 
right we will give it as iv bolus so it does not require additional manpower to and the setup to administer all this infusion so it is a preferred agent okay if cost is a concern even the slight cost difference matters then maybe you can still go ahead with rtpa okay now if i am using let me say rtpa for a catheter guided lysis i might require 25 to 50 milligrams of the fibrinolytic agent instead of 100 that i would be giving here so it gives lower dose and because the dose is directly delivered even when we systemically administer 100 milligrams right the, the site where there is a clot the amount of fibrinolytic agent reaching there will be far less so instead when you do a catheter guided you are delivering the entire dose at the site where there is clot so it will be more effective and studies also show that it is equally or more effective in comparison to systemic fibrinolysis and is associated with lower risk of bleeding the only problem is the resources that it calls for so to do a catheter guided thrombolysis you need a cath lab you need a cardiologist you need a ccu setup adds a lot to the cost burden to the patient so those are the limiting factor as the cost of these things come down in future probably that would replace the systemic fibrinolysis but right now systemic fibrinolysis is the mainstay of treatment in selected set of patients especially with minor bleeding risk we go ahead with catheter guided thrombolysis lower dose of thrombolytic agent required i hope the things are clear okay so that is the mainstay of treatment or i would say the initial management of a case of massive pulmonary embolism along with this we have to also consider anticoagulation anticoagulation okay for the anticoagulation the preferred agents right now are newer oral anticoagulants only in selected set of individuals we prefer the vitamin k antagonist because vitamin k antagonist it needs some time to pick up the target INR okay so that is one of the limiting factor second the newer oral anticoagulants are equally effective or they are more effective and the dose calculation is mostly based on weight or the GFR and it doesn't take into account the like we don't need to really titrate these medications if it is vitamin k antagonist you need to titrate the medication to achieve the target INR of uh, 2 to 3 so that becomes a bit of cumbersome thing and many a times we don't achieve the target INR or patient keeps falling way off the target INR. You escalate a little dose, he goes above the target INR. You de-escalate a little, he falls below the target INR and that is more problematic to the patient than benefiting him, right? So when it comes to anticoagulation, please remember the preferred agent is Novax. This could be a question. Newer oral anticoagulants are the preferred agents. We will discuss more on that when we discuss a hemodynamically stable pulmonary embolism. Okay, now coming to hemodynamically stable pulmonary embolism now in terms of classification these patients belong to either submassive or low risk low risk or mild you can call it as submassive and low risk or mild pulmonary embolism cases okay can we approach both these cases similarly the patients with submassive pulmonary embolism do have some evidence of rv dysfunction right they are on the verge of getting converted into a massive pulmonary embolism on the other hand low risk cases too much of aggressive management might bring in more trouble than benefit them. So how do we differentiate or how do we make decisions? Okay, so for that, let me project to you what is 2019 recommendations from the European Society of Cardiology guidelines. So the European Society of Cardiology 2019 guidelines say that if you have a patient who has hemodynamic instability, it's a high risk case, right? If you look at the chart, hemodynamic instability, that's the first question to ask as I've told you. If the answer is yes, it's a high risk case and you are considering them for fibrinolysis, reperfusion treatment and if patient is hemodynamically unstable, obviously the support would be required. Okay. But those patients who do not have hemodynamic instability, we need to assess their clinical severity and the evidence of right ventricular dysfunction. Two parameters are required for further decision making. Now, how do we get to know the clinical severity? For assessment of clinical severity, it has to be objective, right? It can't be subjective. Like, ah, I feel this patient is really sick. No, that kind of assessment is really detrimental to the patient care. It has to be objective. So we have few parameters to remember here. The first parameter we're talking about is a scoring system called as pulmonary embolism severity index or PESI. Okay, so in PESI, based on the score that patient accrues, we will be categorizing them into five classes, one to five. And class three to four are the ones which are considered as high risk. So these suggest that there is a possible poor outcome. Okay, second, 
because this SC is a cumbersome questionnaire or a cumbersome like the, the list of parameters are like large in number and all those parameters to gather and then assign the scores for them it's really cumbersome to do that on a day-to-day -day ICU practice so instead there is also a version of the pulmonary embolism severity index which is called as SPC simplified pulmonary embolism severity index so in SPC a one point right one point is also considered as high risk so more than or equal to one point on SPC okay you also have third parameter which is called as Hestia criteria Hestia criteria so Hestia criteria is basically a questionnaire where like you ask questions related to the patient's parameters to yourself and if you say yes to any of the question one s yes or more than that would mean it's a high risk case so more than or equal to one yes here okay so in all these three cases you would say that the clinical severity warrants more aggressive management if it is a pesty class one or two it doesn't warrant aggressive management if spc zero scores it doesn't warrant aggressive management if hestia criteria you say no for all the all the questions on the questionnaire that means it doesn't warrant aggressive management okay so if any of this is present it warrants aggressive management and the second parameter we are looking at is the right ventricular dysfunction so for the rv dysfunction we are looking at the echo and I've already discussed the echo parameters to say that this particular patient has RV dysfunction. What are the parameters we have discussed? RV by LV end diastolic diameter ratio more than one or RV end diastolic diameter more than three centimeters. Yeah, there are other parameters including the tricuspid uh, regurgitant velocity and all not required for us. If you remember this much is more than enough for the NETSS. Okay, so if there is evidence of RV dysfunction, that also calls for aggressive management. So if either clinical severity index show that it is severe, right? or if there is evidence of RV dysfunction present, any one of these two present, we will be doing a troponin test. Why do we do the troponin test? To assess if there is micro infarcts developing or there is myocardial injury or ischemia setting in. So if the troponin is positive, if the troponin is positive, these patients will be considered as intermediate group and high risk. These are like intermediate risk group, right? The extreme high risk group is the one which directly went into thrombolysis. The rest are intermediate and low risk patients. But in this intermediate risk patient itself, we are trying to differentiate them into intermediate high risk and intermediate low risk. So if the troponin is positive, these are the patients who are called as intermediate high risk, right? What are the parameters positive here? The PESI patient belongs to class three or four, or if you're not doing PESI and if you're just simply following the S PESI, patient has one or more than one points on it, or on HTA criteria, you have said yes to one or more than one questions. Or if clinical severity parameters are fair, but there is evidence of RV dysfunction on the echo or both, okay? Then you do a troponin test. Troponin positive, that is the intermediate risk, high risk group. And if the troponin is negative, it is intermediate low risk group. So for the high risk group, you need to hospitalize them obviously, but you need to do a very close monitoring. And if required, these patients, like if they deteriorate on anticoagulation, anticoagulation is anyway the bedrock of management. You would have started a neuroral anticoagulant or heparin or whatever parameters that we could do. On this bedrock, if the patient deteriorates, we need to consider them for a rescue perfusion, rescue reperfusion, or in other words, rescue thrombolysis right and as i've already told you the window for this rescue thrombolysis is up to 14 days window period is up to 14 days so anywhere from the day of diagnosis to the 14th day post diagnosis if the patient is deteriorating you can consider them for thrombolysis okay now there is one controversial point we need to remember should these patients intermediate high risk group patient be taken for thrombolysis like if you look at this table now it kind of creates confusion because reperfusion is definitely indicated for the hemodynamic lens stable patient but these stable patients with uh, rv dysfunction or clinical severity showing severity and troponin i being positive should we consider for thrombolysis well right now the guideline guidelines are not very clear but it, it doesn't mean that you can't consider. It basically means that you weigh in the risks and benefit then take a call whether you want to consider thrombolysis. There is encouraging trends from the recently published literature that taking these patients for thrombolysis is associated with significantly better outcomes with minor increase in the risk of intracranial bleeds or bleeding elsewhere. So there is slight increase in the risk of bleeding, but there is also prognostic benefit. So you might consider, but at least the bare minimum you can offer to these patients is hospitalize 
anticoagulate and closely monitor for deterioration evidence of deterioration take them for rescue thrombolysis okay if they are troponin negative these are intermediate risk but low risk such patients you don't need to thrombolyze immediately right you just hospitalize and continue your anticoagulation you will hospitalize and continue anticoagulation but even if these patients deteriorate you might have to consider we have to keep that in mind but if, if these patients are deteriorating anyway they will become troponin positive and they will follow this path right okay now coming to the other side where there is no rv dysfunction there is the signs of clinical severity show that it is not high risk parameter in such patients like you say no to this you say no to this in such patients if you have other compelling reasons for hospitalization then you treat them in the hospital okay if there are no compelling reason for hospitalization you might consider them for early discharge and further anticoagulation at home because we are talking about novax as the preferred agent probably they don't need to do repeated hospital visits for titration of the anticoagulants also right so early discharge and home treatment is the mainstay of treatment okay so that's the broad approach now few key points about anticoagulation right what are the options we have for the anticoagulation what is the duration of anticoagulation that is recommended when do you follow up the patient right so for anticoagulation the first option is vitamin k antagonist and currently they are not preferred agents not preferred agents okay even if there is cost concern and you want to use it the target inr can be asked as an mcq so the target inr is 2.5 or you can say the range of 2 to 3 that's the target inr okay there's only one condition i want you to remember where we continue to use the vitamin k antagonists as the preferred agents over novax right preferred agents over novax for only one condition that is your apla so antiphospholipid antibody syndrome this remains a preferred agent and also you have to remember that in case of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome the duration of anticoagulation is lifelong so if you have a apla patient presenting to you with the pulmonary embolism you will start him on heparin for initial anticoagulation then you have to bridge it like you use heparin as a bridge you start with vitamin k antagonist it might take anywhere between 5 to 10 days to achieve the target inr and then you can stop the heparin so you need this heparin cover in those patients okay so that's about vitamin k antagonist now the next option we have is newer oral anticoagulants and as i've already told you these are going to be our preferred agents we will consider these as preferred agents cool now previously there used to be a question what is the preferred anticoagulant in malignancy cases and we used to say that heparin or low molecular weight heparin used to be the preferred agents okay but now because we have the evidence of uh, the safety of newer anticoagulants in malignancy also so in malignant patients also these are preferred agents so i'm saying including malignant cases except except gastrointestinal malignancy so for all other cases these are preferred agent except gastrointestinal malignancies for all other cases you will use a novac as a preferred agent okay so that's about the newer oral anticoagulants now coming to the duration of anticoagulation they do often ask us about the duration of anticoagulants and when do you ask the patient to come back for follow-up so the duration of anticoagulation is generally three to six months we don't need to give anticoagulation for most patients for more than three to six months so there has to be some compelling indication for us to give anticoagulation beyond that period okay so after the diagnosis and you initiate you manage initial thing whatever whether thrombolysis or no thrombolysis you anticoagulate and send the patient home you ask them for a follow-up at three to six months harrison mentioned six week to six months but the 2019 guidelines mentioned three to six months so let us stick to it three to six months so mostly at the end of three months you ask the patient to come back for follow-up during the follow-up there are some additional steps to be required mainly to see if there is post embolism sequelae 
like most some of these patients develop something called as chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension so if they have developed that again the management is going to be different it's going to be a little more complicated we'll discuss more on that when we take up the ct uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension as a separate video module if they have not developed that then well and good right if there is no indication for extended anticoagulation we would withdraw the anticoagulation and send the patient home Okay, so how do we get to know whether the patient has developed the sequelae? So at the end of three to six months, when he comes back for follow-up, we will see whether the patient has dyspnea or any functional limitation. Okay, if there is no dyspnea, no functional limitation, okay, like for assessing functional limitation, you can use the cardiopulmonary exercise testing or you can look at the six-minute walk distance, right, or you can use the questionnaires or you can also take into account the NYHA status or grade of the patient. If there are no functional limitations, patient is not having any dyspnea, you will see whether there are other risk factors for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And if none of them are present, right, then we have to just focus on anticoagulation and whether there is need for extended anticoagulation. If need, we will continue. Otherwise, maybe we can withdraw. Okay. On the other hand, if patient has dyspnea or has functional limitation, Right. In that case, it is recommended that we do a transthoracic echo, not the transesophageal echo, transthoracic echo to determine the probability of pulmonary hypertension. If echo says that, yeah, possibly there is pulmonary hypertension, there are clues to think of pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary artery systolic pressure is elevated. Right. If there is high probability of patient having pulmonary hypertension, we have to go for a VQ scan, ventilation perfusion can to see if there are any mismatched perfusion defects. VQ scan is the diagnostic modality of choice for diagnosing chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. So if there are mismatched perfusion defects, that means ventilation is good, but there are multiple areas where the perfusion is not happening. That indicates that patient has developed the chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and such cases like it is around 3 to 4 percent patients of acute PE develop chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and we need to refer them for a specialist center for further management. The management approach and all we will discuss in the separate video module. Okay. Now if echo the probability of pulmonary hypertension to be there is considered as intermediate, then we will look at some extra parameters. We will see whether N-terminal probe ENP is elevated. It tells that the right ventricle is still being stretched. Or we will see there are established risk factors for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension in the patient's uh, parameters. Or if cardiopulmonary exercise testing results are abnormal, if any one of this is present, we will deal it as a high risk and we will go ahead with VQ scan again. If none of them are present or the echo probability of patient having pulmonary hypertension is very low, in those cases, like the starting point was that these patients were dyspneic or had functional limitations. So we have to look for alternative explanation or diagnosis for these patients functional limitation. We don't need to attribute it to the pulmonary embolism leading to pulmonary hypertension or chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Look for alternate causes. Patient may be having other causes for these symptoms. Right? That's the approach that we will be following. Clear? Okay. So that brings us to the end of the discussion. But before we wind up, just a quick look at the indications where we need to consider extended period of anticoagulation. Three to six months is a normal thing, but there are three important indications where we will be doing an extended period of anticoagulation. If you had open Harrison, he'll tell you that in the past we used to follow this criteria called as provoked versus unprovoked uh, thrombus formation. Like if there was a DVT and P which was provoked. Okay. And if there was a DVT or P which was unprovoked, unprovoked cases, we used to give extended anticoagulation. Provoked cases, we used to give short duration, that is three to six months. But now Harrison and the 2019 European Society of Cardiology guidelines clearly mentioned that we should not be using those terminologies anymore. It makes no difference. All we need to do is for all patients, we are practically thinking of three to six months of anticoagulation and extended anticoagulation only for three indications. Number one indication is no identifiable risk factors no identifiable risk factors. So if you have a patient with DVT or PE where you are not able to identify any risk factor, that means you will not be able to address that factor which caused the coagulation. If you know an identifiable risk factor, you can address it, then probably uh, the further risk of coagulation comes down. But if we don't know any identifiable risk factor, that means there are risk factors which we don't know and it might contribute to further occurrence of DVT and pulmonary embolism. So better these patients should be on extended anticoagulation. Second thing is, if there is a risk factor which is persistent like we know there is a risk factor it led to the development of uh, the dvt and embolism but because we cannot negate or nullify the risk factor it is better to give the anticoagulation a typical example i can quote is apla right antiphospholipid antibody syndrome will not be able to 
eliminate the Aplos syndrome from the patient. So he will continue to have that risk factor. So better to anticoagulate him permanently. Right. Okay. The third indication is patients who had minor transient risk factor. See, if you have a minor and a very transient risk factor, probably that was not the sole reason or the main reason for the patient to develop DVT. We're talking about minor risk factor. Like we can consider smoking as a risk factor. Right? He has he had smoking history and he has quit it. Now, just because he had a smoking history, we cannot say that, yeah, that was the main reason for this patient to develop DVT and PE. Unlikely. It did, it did probably contribute, but there must be something else which we have missed. So it is better that such patient should be getting extended period of anticoagulation. Okay, beyond six months. For a classical case of APLA, it is lifelong that I want you to remember. Okay, now before signing off guys, we will take a quick look at the criteria as named parameters we spoke in this video module. Because sometimes questions can be asked mainly from the, if, if they're asking questions, they're still basing it on the well score for the diagnostic algorithm. But still at least SPC, I want you to remember. PESI bit complex to remember, Hestia questionnaire is bit complex to remember, but at least SPC you, can, you should remember so that you can identify those intermediate high risk group patients. Okay. So this is our Hestia criteria. Here you will see 11 questions like whether patient is hemodynamically unstable, thrombolysis or embolectomy, whether it is necessary, any risk of bleeding or whether there is active bleeding going on, whether he is requiring oxygen to maintain SpO2 more than 90% for at least 24 hours plus whether pulmonary embolism was diagnosed while patient being on an anticoagulant right such patients are at high risk of developing clots again okay and then whether the patient is in severe pain of the affected limb requiring IV pain medications for more than 24 hours or requiring multiple doses in the emergency room to reduce his pain okay or if there is any medical or social reason for treatment in the hospital for more than 24 hours then CKD or creatinine clearance less than 30 ml per minute or severe liver disease patient being pregnant or documented history of heparin induced thrombocytopenia if you say yes for any of this right this patient would be considered as high risk among those intermediate risk group okay this is our pulmonary embolism severity index severity index so this looks into the parameters like age gender malignancy chronic heart failure chronic pulmonary disease, pulse rate more than 110, SBP less than 100, respiratory more than 30, temperature less than 36, whether patient is in altered mental status and whether hypoxia is present. And based on that, we will assign the class. So if the score is less than 65, it's class 1. If it is 66 to 85, it is class 2. Class 1, class 2 do not have bad prognosis, right? But class 3, class 4 we are considering. If it is between 86 to 105, or if it is between 106 to 125, it will be considered as class 3 and class 4. These are the patients which we were considering as evidence of clinical severity, right? Okay, that is PESI. Now looking at SPESI, Simplified Pulmonary Embolism Severity Index. So it is only taking into account simple parameters like age more than 80 years, history of cancer, chronic cardiopulmonary disease, systolic BP less than 100 or heart rate more than 110 and SpO2 less than 90 percent right so these parameters can be easily embedded into a question so i want you to remember age 80 plus history of malignancy chronic cardiopulmonary disease systolic bp less than 100 or heart rate more than 110 and spo2 less than 90 if any of these are there that would indicate a clinical severity so in the intermediate risk group this would put the patient towards the possible high risk group so we will be looking at troponin if such a patient presents to us okay so with that we are winding up guys uh, important take home messages are that be aware about the algorithm for the diagnosis algorithm for the management most of the questions are going to come from this yeah pharmacology related questions might come about these uh, thrombolytic agents and all that will be again dealt in detail in the hematology section signing off guys see you all the best